Greetings. My name is Marjorie Arca. I have been a pediatric surgeon for about 20 years. This longevity in the field has naturally lent itself to the highs and lows that our discipline offers. I have been known to say that pediatric surgery is like playing the highest stakes poker game. That when you win, you win big because you win the health and well-being of that child, not only at this particular moment, but for the rest of his or her life. But when you lose, you equally lose big because you also lose that potential of that child's life at its fullest. Through the years, I have been in many situations when in the course of caring for a child, serious adverse events have occurred. Patient outcomes have run the gamut of prolonged hospitalization, less than desirable outcomes, loss of function, and even loss of life. In addition, I have also been in situations where serious personal losses and challenges in my own life have led to severe anxiety, uncertainty, and doubt. As a resident, my very first complication was a pneumothorax in a patient on whom I was placing a central venous line. As I called my attending to confess this complication, he told me that this is a rite of passage and I should learn how to deal with even bigger complications as I do bigger surgical cases. He also quoted French surgeon René Lariche, who said that every surgeon carries with him a small cemetery where from time to time he goes to pray, a place of bitterness and regret where he must look for an explanation of his failures in his life. During those years of training, I was taught to deal with complications head on, to be completely honest with the patient and the family, but still continue to move on with a stiff upper lip and a firm resolve to do better next time. At Morbidity and Mortality Conference, I hung my head, I explained my complications, I recognized my shortcomings as if beating my chest I am saying mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Yet, in that full decade of surgical training, there was never any time when anyone taught me how to deal with these feelings of guilt, loss, inadequacies, or even self-loathing when these complications arise. Looking back, I find myself fortunate because along the way, I have slowly found people on whom I leaned heavily whenever the burden seemed too heavy. I have a husband who is a physician who has slowly understood the professional demands and culture of surgery. He has mastered the art of quiet acceptance, whether I'm wailing against the fates or crying uncontrollably in anger and disbelief. I also have friends, both far and near, who have seen me at my most vulnerable in those darkest moments when I have nothing more to give. They too allow me the grace without judgment, the time to heal, the chance to slowly recover, all the while accompanied with respect and love that is due any human being at her lowest point. These people are angels who are only a text or a phone call away. Their understanding, commiseration, and compassion stem from a shared experience of knowing what I am going through. In my professional sphere, as a part of a larger group of surgeons, I have always tried to be one of those people who would give my colleagues unconditional support whenever they needed it. However, I am acutely aware that support from your partners have inherent limitations. First, few of us have training to give peer support. Second, a surgeon may be in solo practice and have no one else to turn to. Third, surgeons may have a fear of lost confidence from one's partners on whom they would confide. And lastly, in a practical sense, someone in a leadership position such as a division chief may not have someone to ask for help. I cannot overemphasize the importance of peer support 
from people who have walked your journey, who have been trained to listen in a non-judgmental way, acknowledge your truth at the moment, and offer words of support and modes of coping. Peer support within our pediatric surgical community normalizes the fact that stresses and challenges are setbacks that we all go through. Peer support allows us the grace to recover and makes us not just better doctors and surgeons, but also better people. Reaching out is not a weakness, but a sign of strength and a will to grow. Each one of us will have storms to weather and our response as a community should be one of understanding, compassion, and forgiveness. For this response defines us. When we take care of each other as surgeons, it will improve our overall well-being, bringing better quality of care to our patients, their families, and ourselves. Thank you for listening. I really want to thank Marge Arca for sharing her personal experience uh, during a difficult time and especially how she was able to rely on a colleague to help her uh, recover after the event. And our goal during today's episode, uh, part three, is to really help all of you feel comfortable conducting a, an informal peer support encounter if any of your colleagues is ever struggling to give you the tools to help you help them. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be here. I'm Lauren Berman. I'm one of the pediatric surgeons at Nemours Children's Hospital in Delaware. Uh, I'm a member of our peer support program, and I'm here with Karen Mulhader, who's one of our psychologists, who is the director of training for the Nemours peer support program. So I'm really thrilled to be here with Karen. Go to the next slide. So as we start to have this conversation today, what I would really encourage everyone to think about is peer support, not just as an isolated conversation, but actually as a way that you can change culture and you can lead culture change in your organizations. I think many of us grew up in an era where the only uh, forum that adverse events were discussed in was morbidity and mortality conference. And I know many of those conferences have a reputation for being very malignant. Um, and I think people were made, were made to feel that they made a mistake because they were a bad doctor or a bad person. And really, it's just human to make mistakes. I think our profession really encourages us to be very stoic and deny emotions. Uh, peer support helps normalize reactions to having an adverse event um, and makes us all feel or reminds us all that we are human and this is normal. Um, I think it converts us from a realm of isolation to feeling more that we're part of a community and that we are not alone in this and that we all struggle with this from time to time. And then finally, to think about self-care, not as something that's selfish, but that's essential for us to be the best surgeons that we can be and really take the best care of our patients. So I can go to the next slide. I'm gonna turn things over to Karen. So before we get started into how to conduct a peer support encounter, I wanna just have everyone take pause for a second and think about if you had made a mistake or experienced a similar event to your colleague, how would you want to be supported or treated? We're thinking about would an error change the way you interact with your colleagues? Um, if you knew one of your colleagues was in a dark place, how would you help or support them? And we wanna think about how to incorporate peer support into your daily practice. Um, at times it can be challenging to know what to say or how to check in on colleagues when they've experienced a workplace event. Um, as we've heard in the second peer support training, that as fixers, we might wanna offer suggestions or ask many questions and try to change the situation. When really peer support uses skills and strategies to explore and normalize experiencing stress. And often the best fix is listening and creating a space for conversation and to explore those feelings that your colleagues are having. How to get started. So in some cases, you may want to acknowledge that a challenging event has occurred. You may want to say something along the lines of, I heard there was um, a difficult outcome in the OR yesterday, or I heard you were involved with a really tough case, kind of open the door for conversation. Other times, you might simply just ask a colleague how they're doing 
but give them time so that they can talk and have a conversation. So, you know, we often ask people how they are as we're passing by them in hallways or elevators or, you know, as you're going into the OR. And really, if there's been an event, we want to offer support or give time to talk when there is privacy and ability for the person to engage in conversation. Um, and acknowledge to yourself that it's okay if you don't fix it or cheer them up. This really is normalizing, experiencing stress, and we want to avoid what we call bright siding, and we saw that in the video from Inside Out, where just kind of saying like, it's okay, and it'll get better, and all the kind of changing directions to try to make someone feel better actually is not as supportive as allowing them to express their feelings and express how they're doing in the situation. So the first step is often exploration. And when we talk about exploration, we talk about rewarding the thoughts and statements that you're hearing. We wanna use tentative statements to clarify understanding instead of direct statements that you, you know, are making assumptions about the case. So sometimes that means asking a question or summarizing a theme of conversation. So some examples might be, you're wondering what might happen. People may judge you and kind of leave that as a question mark, or it sounds like most of your concerns are about getting through the next few days. By exploring feelings, associates feel heard and they have the chance to clarify what they mean. Um, it may feel repetitive when you're doing it, if you're repeating back what they said, but really it's shown that when you repeat back, it is allowing clarification and also shows that person that you're really listening and taking the time to understand what they're going through. Um, and think about how you might restate some of their comments or statements. We're gonna watch a brief video clip that demonstrates the skill. I was just gonna ask, can you give me uh, one sentence about um, what happened? I don't need to know the details, but I just wanted to know where you're coming from and what uh, what happened briefly. Sure. Um, well, I was set up to do a pretty routine appendectomy. Um, happened to be on a pediatrician's child. And um, when I put my initial trocar in, um, found my way into the aorta. Mm. And we controlled it and the child survived, but it was a pretty rattling event. Well, wow. so that's uh, um, that must have been very challenging to have that conversation with the family. I was so the next step in exploration, and we saw in that clip, we saw an example of kind of summarizing that the person gave their in information, but then we heard, wow, that must have been a challenging situation and kind of taking pause to facilitate next steps of the conversation. So another step in exploration is labeling feelings. In this situation, what we wanna be able to do is give other words for maybe some feelings that people are expressing. Um, it's an incredibly important tool because it can help kind of explore what they're feeling and clarify, help that person even clarify more what they're experiencing due to the stressor. It also helps people feel heard, understood, and accepted. So you might hear things, somebody saying that they're feeling sad or hurt, they're feeling insecure, but these are all other words that you can use that might help get conversation going deeper into how they're really feeling about the event. Maybe they're feeling embarrassed, maybe they're feeling stressed or worried. Um, it you know, can be helpful sometimes to open the door by saying it's overwhelming, you're feeling angry, you're feeling vulnerable, and taking pause and allowing them to kind of share a little bit more about what those feelings are meaning to them. Um, and you might also think about how labeling helps them identify what areas they would need help in as you're discussing the situation. Another part of exploration is deepening the inquiry. So we can ask open-ended questions using how, what, tell me about, convey compassion and not judgment. So we wanna avoid things like why. And we wanna be curious and avoid interrogating. Remember, this is not an m, &M. This is not getting the details of the case to then offer suggestions as to what 
they could do in the next situation. We really want to have a natural conversation about the event that occurred and how to provide compassion and support for the person that is experiencing the stress. So exploring is not a debrief. Oftentimes it's easy to review all the facts and details, but it's more important to take pause and explore the feelings that someone is having. Thinking about questions like, how do you feel about what happened? Tell me about how the event has been impacting you. What's it like to be at work or home when you're feeling this way? These are all ways where you can explore further how someone's doing emotionally without getting into the details of the case. The next step we think about is normalizing. So we wanna reassure our colleagues that their reactions and emotions are normal. We wanna share your experience when appropriate. So as we've talked about before, you may briefly share a similar event, but we wanna keep the focus on the person you're providing support to. But you may be able to say things like, it's understandable that you would feel worried, or it's understandable that you would feel stressed. In this situation, feeling frustrated is totally normal. When I faced something like that, I felt overwhelmed. Um, and then sometimes saying something without getting into the details of, I've been there, would you like to know what helped me? So when we think about things that can happen after stress, stressful events, certainly things like reliving the event, having feelings or reactions about the event after it's occurred, thinking about it all the time, these can happen very naturally, and we wanna normalize that experience for people we're providing support for. And like I said, we wanna keep the focus on them and not you, but sometimes giving an example of, it helped me to talk to my colleagues, or it helped me to take a day where I was able to kind of focus on how I was feeling and identify what was gonna help me feel better, can be helpful because again, we wanna work on changing the culture of the stress that everyone experiences during these events. There's often phases of recovery when it comes to stressful events. So we all always want to normalize that having intrusive, repetitive, trouble sleeping, um, reliving the event, fearing that a similar event could happen again, being able to unable to concentrate or getting easily distracted, feeling depressed. These are all normal feelings that can occur after um, an unexpected or negative outcome. And we wanna normalize that they're not alone. So we're gonna watch a brief um, clip, normalizing and reflecting on an event. While each of us respond to this differently, I want you to know that both I and uh, some of your other Older partners have had experiences just like this. We've walked this path and and empathize with you a lot. Um, this is a this can be really traumatic and it can keep you up at night and so forth. It, um, one of the things that uh, I think it's super important for you to know from our perspective is that the fact that you feel bad about this means you're a good doctor and. Um, uh, on the far side of this, as you look back, uh, the things I'm about to say will be self-evident to you. But right now I can see it's a little bit unknown. Uh, I want to reassure you that um, uh, as a peer supporter, my job is to pull you away from this keyhole that makes you think that your rest of your career is going to be defined by this one event. It will not. You are, you are not this mistake. It will not define you. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really, uh, right now, while it's fresh, it's pretty hard, but just like you counsel your patients about how wounds will feel a little bit better every day, um, right now, while this is right up in front and in your proximate memory, it's so hard to step away from it and it can be something that we perseverate about. And yet, as time goes on, this is going to get better and, and, uh. And that's just an example of kind of sharing a little bit about how as time things get better, even normalizing the situation, but also not giving too many details about Dr. High's per personal events or personal experiences in this situation. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Berman. 
Thanks, Karen. I just wanted to build on the concept of normalizing for a minute. And, and this is really relevant in the conversations we're having with colleagues that we work with every day. Because I think in these conversations with our colleagues, we're in a really unique position to not just normalize that what they're feeling is what anyone would be feeling or many people would be feeling in that situation, but that you can affirm their skills. Saying things like this could have happened to me. You know, when Kurt just said to Matt in the video, we have walked this path, we've been in your shoes, it makes them feel like they can maybe think about going on and not um, get stuck in that keyhole that, that Kurt mentioned and think of this as the defining event of their career. Uh, when you see other people who have gone through challenges and then emerged, uh, who you see as role models who are successful, you know, whether it's a senior leader in your division or a colleague that you might be similar in, in years of experience to, but you really respect, you know, hearing those words from someone who knows you um, and can affirm you is really powerful. And I think just helping remind us that our job is really, really hard um, and it's really, really rewarding, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it can be really, really challenging. And, and just being there for each other when we, you know, go through these dark times um, is very powerful. So I'm gonna briefly talk a little bit about follow-up or wrapping up the peer support interaction. So one of the things we wanna think about is just assessing coping resources. So when you're talking to someone is, who will be their support person at home? Or it may be another support person at work, thinking about what do you need from them? So sometimes it's helpful to check in and say, you know, would it be okay if I check in with you at a later time about this? Um, sometimes to help generate what's been helpful is thinking about um, having them think about what they've gone through in similar challenges in the past and what might have helped them recover. So it might not be a similar challenge at work, but you know what's gotten you through difficult times in the past. It might be a hobby, it might be social support, um, it might be distraction, exercise. It may be taking time off and helping them kind of think about ideas that will support them as they move through this experience. One of the things that I think can be helpful too is to focus on the coping skills and the coping style that that person already has and not necessarily trying to introduce new ones because you know one person might say I benefited from talking to a close friend or I benefited from going running um, where another person might have benefited from something totally different and we want to leave it open to kind of what fits best for them. So we're going to watch a brief video clip of how people have coped in the past. While we each mourn a little differently when something like this happens, there are some similarities that that uh, occur. When you uh, have dealt with adverse events in the past, how um, what did you do to help gain perspective again? Uh, you didn't you didn't get into this responsible position by parachuting there. You, you you're a durable uh, you know, uh, road tested individual. How did, how did you cope in the past? What did you do that was successful? Yeah. I mean, I've fallen back on some of the things like, um, you know, spending quality time with my family, you know, people that I know, um, value me for, you know, uh, the person that I am, um, irrespective of the work that I do, um, uh, try to blow off steam or, you know, um, that sort of thing from with exercise. And so we see in this clip kind of helping, he's helping, um, understand what are things that were helpful in the past and kind of taking pause and thinking about how do you typically cope with stressors. So when we think about follow-up, again, the other thing it's nice to do, and I briefly mentioned before, is make a plan. Um, make a plan for what are things they can do to cope in the interim. Um, ask to see if you could check in again, um, or maybe even make a statement that you will check in again. Because sometimes if we ask someone, you know, would you like me to check in again, or can I check in about this? They may feel like, no, that's not necessary. I'm okay. When really we want to extend the information that like supporting each other and being a part of 
peer support doesn't just end with that first interaction. So you might say, you know, I'll check in on you again next week after you've had some time to see how you're doing. Um, and then at times it might be appropriate for referrals. Um, and many institutions have different referrals that can support colleagues. And it's often helpful to just kind of, if you feel like that would be important to ask the person, you know, is this something where you would want some help getting referrals from some other support? And then that might be something you can talk about at your next meeting. Um, summarize the conversation and encourage the use of coping resources and really end by saying you'll check in again soon. And again, I think we like to avoid asking to check in because people might you know, already feel um, concerned that they're taking up time or that you know, this is something they don't wanna talk about when really we know from those surveys that people do wanna be supported by their colleagues and they do wanna be checked in by people from their team. And I'm just gonna wrap up my portion with a quote because I think when it comes to peer support, um, We've talked about strategies, you've heard about strategies, some of the literature and the data about peer support, but really what's most important is it does not need to be perfect, it does not need to be by the book. Really, we wanna let other people know that there's a culture change of supporting each other, normalizing stressful events. And I think this quote kind of sums it up perfectly, that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Um, and that quote by Maya Angelou really kind of helps summarize that letting them know in a time of stress that you were there for them and you help them feel supported is what they're going to remember and then hopefully pass on in their own work with other people and keep the peer support going throughout their work. Thank you so much, Karen. I think my final message to you as we wrap up our, our third part of this informal peer support training is really that each of you can play a critical role, whether you are a, a clinical leader or a member of a division uh, or just a friend of a surgeon and perhaps even at another institution. I think our message is to always reach out or to make sure someone else is reaching out to a person who is involved in a significant adverse event. I think just because sometimes we're very good at putting up a front and things may seem okay, but they're not actually okay. So it's just always better to ask. In uh, this way, we can work to overcome the taboo that has existed for so long in, in surgery in general uh, around sharing and expressing feelings. And I think especially leaders can be role models by initiating these conversations and also being willing to talk about their own vulnerability and their own experience. Um, so I will say once again, we are each in a unique position to affirm the skills of our colleagues and our partners uh, and build back their confidence and help draw them out of that keyhole that we often, I think most of us have faced when we've had a significant bad outcome um, and uh, move ourselves into that thriving category rather than just going on in survival mode or, or deciding to leave surgery altogether. So, we appreciate the time that you've taken to uh, tune in to these uh, three episodes of peer support training. Um, we are excited to announce that APSA is actually working on developing a formal peer support program. So if you lack a program in your institution or you're not really sure how to go about it, but you think someone needs help, you'll be able to go online to a portal and submit an anonymous uh, referral uh, for someone who needs help. You can do this for yourself or for a colleague uh, more to come on that at our annual meeting uh, in May. And, and thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And thank you, Karen and Holly, uh, for your expertise.